By profession, I'm a teacher. There's great satisfaction in helping people gain new insights and understanding. However, over the years, I've learned to rein in this teaching impulse, especially around my wife and my children. Sometimes people just don't want to hear or don't want to understand. For example, 30-something years ago, we lived in a small town in Indiana of about 5,000 people. As we were preparing to move, a factory closed and 40 houses joined our house on the market. Under the circumstances, I was ecstatic when an offer to purchase was received. But my very frugal wife was not happy that we had to sell our house at a loss. I tried. I tried really hard to explain to her that under the economic concept of sunk costs, the price we originally paid for this house was totally irrelevant. The important thing was to focus on the current circumstance. As long as the buyer was willing to offer a bid equal to the market value, we should accept and sell. Well, we sold the house. My wife was able to move forward. But I guarantee you, to this day, she can tell you exactly how much we lost on the down payment and all the improvements we made into the property. And I'm very not allowed to use the word sunk cost in our family. Now, the important lesson with regards to sunk cost is to focus on the things that you can control, to look towards the possibilities ahead, not behind. You can't change your past. You cannot necessarily control all current circumstances, but you can make a realistic assessment and you can move forward. The principle can be applied equally to the spiritual life. How many of us have experienced difficulty in letting go of something in the past? It might be a financial event that tanked, or it could be a disastrous personal or relational decision, or a hurtful experience, or even our own mistakes. These life experiences can generate resentment, bitterness, and guilt. If we let the, the past define us, this negativity can become our core identity. One of Satan's greatest lies is that we are a prisoner of our past with no hope for the future. Thanks be to God, unfortunately, you and I are an Easter people. Our Lord and Savior died and rose for us. He conquered sin and death so that we can live in his love and in his mercy. You and I are redeemed and renewed. We have hope in Jesus Christ. In today's gospel, the apostles are on the cusp of discovering this great hope we have in Christ. Now remember, Peter has denied the Lord three times and all the others fled from the garden. They're fearful of being arrested as accomplices of Jesus and they don't know what to make of the news of the empty tomb. And suddenly, he is in their midst. Was their astonishment mingled with shame? Was joy tempered by an anticipation of a stinging rebuke? But the first words of Jesus are, peace be with you. He says it not once, but twice. He shows them the wounds in his glorified body, and then he entrusts them with a mission and empowers them for it. The resurrected Christ points to our eternal future, not to our past. His glorified body shows that we no longer need to fear death. Death has no power over us if we hold on to Christ. The resurrected Christ receives us in mercy the chains of sin are severed and can no longer bind us. Satan has no power over those who cling to Jesus Christ. This is not just good news. This is stupendous, amazing news. But how often today are people more like St. Thomas, who was not present when the resurrected Christ came into the tomb? How many people 
or willing to characterize Jesus as simply a wise teacher or a model of unselfish moral living. But they cannot believe him to be divine or resurrected. Is it possible to be too good to be true? Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the nail marks and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. Jesus invited St. Thomas to touch the wounds in his hands and in his side. And of course, St. Thomas replied, my Lord and my God. He saw and he believed. But Jesus said, have you come to believe because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. These words of Jesus are for us. The transformation of the apostles and the other disciples from cowards quivering behind locked doors into fearless evangelists begins at this encounter with the resurrected Lord and culminates with the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. They no longer fear the authorities, nor do they fear suffering or death. They were willing to go to the ends of the earth in service of the gospel because they had finally seen Jesus as God and Lord, and they had experienced his love and mercy firsthand. The certainty of the resurrection cemented their trust in the mercy of God and his desire to loosen the bonds of our past. It is said that the apostle St. Thomas ventured the furthest as a missionary. It's reported that he traveled to India where he founded a Christian church and died there as a martyr to the good news. God gives us the gift of faith to perceive his presence in our daily lives. The sacraments established by Jesus and entrusted to the church guarantee that God is acting at every stage of our physical and spiritual lives, at baptism, confirmation, penance, Eucharist, holy orders, marriage, and anointing of the sick. They are the most visible signs of God's faithful, loving mercy towards his sinful but repentant children. We will celebrate the good news of Easter for many weeks. But today, the church has set aside a day devoted to divine mercy. The world rejected, tortured, and killed Jesus Christ. When raised from the dead, Jesus came to his disciples with the same words that greet us at each Mass. Peace be with you. Today especially, let us rejoice and give thanks for this great gift of mercy.